Hello, and welcome to another installment of Tales and Tales, a summer reading program brought to you by Alabama Public Library Services and the Hale County Library. My name is Ian Crawford, and today it's my pleasure to read from Nathaniel Hawthorne's Twice Told Tales. Today, we're going to read The Sister Years. Last night, between 11 and 12 o'clock, when the old year was leaving her final footprints on the borders of time's empire, she found herself in possession of a few spare moments and sat down all, of all places of, the, of earth on the steps of our new city hall. The wintry moonlight showed that she looked weary of body and sad of heart, like many another wayfarer of earth. Her garments, having been exposed to much foul weather and rough usage, were all in very ill condition. And as the hurry of her journey had never allowed her before to take an instant's rest, her shoes were so worn as to be scarcely worth the mending. But after trudging only and a little distance further, this poor old year was destined to enjoy a long, long sleep. I forgot to mention that when she seated herself on the steps, she deposited by her side a very capacious bandbox in which, as is the custom among travelers of her sex, she carried a great deal of valuable property. Besides this luggage, there was a folio book under her arm, very much resembling the annual volume of a newspaper. Placing this volume across her knees and resting her elbows on it, with her forehead at her hands, the weary, bedraggled, old worn year heaved a heavy sigh and appeared to be taking no very pleasant retrospect in her past existence. While she thus awaited the midnight knell, that was to summon her to the innumerable sisterhood of departed years, there came a young maiden treading light, lightsomely on tiptoe along the street from the direction of the railroad depot. She was evidently a stranger and perhaps had come to town by the evening train of cars. There was a smiling cheerfulness in this fair maiden's face which bespoke her fully confident to a kind reception of the multitude of people with whom she was soon to form an acquaintance. Her dress was rather too airy for the season and was bedizened with fluttering ribbons and other vanities which, may, which were likely soon to be rent away by fierce storms or to fade in the hot sunshine amidst which she was to pursue her changeful course. But still she was wonderfully pleasant looking figure. She had so much promise and so such an indescribable hopefulness in her aspect that hardly anybody could meet her without anticipating some very good desirable thing, the consummation of some long sought good from her kind offices. A few dismal characters there may be, here and there about the world, who have so often been trifled with by young maidens as promising as she, that have now ceased to pin any faith upon the skirts of the new year. But for my own part, I have great faith in her, and should I live to see 50 such more, still from each of those successive sisters, I reckon upon receiving that there will be one worth living for. The new year, for this young maiden was no less a personage, carried all her goods and chattels in a basket of no great size or weight, which hung upon her arm. She greeted the disconsolate old year with great affection and sat down beside her on the steps of the city hall, waiting for the signal to begin her rambles through the world. The two were own sisters, being both granddaughters of time, and though one looked so much older than the other, it was rather owing to hardships and trouble than to age, since there was but a 12 months difference between them. Well, my dear sister, said the new year, after the first salutations, you look almost tired to death. What have you been driving about your sojourn in this part of infinite space? Oh, I have it all recorded here in my book of chronicles, answered the old year in a heavy tone. There is nothing that would amuse you, and you will soon get sufficient knowledge of such matters from your own personal experience. It is but tiresome reading. Nevertheless, she turned over the leaves of the folio and glanced at them by the light of the moon, feeling an irresistible spell of interest in her own biography, although its incidents were remembered without pleasure. The volume, though she termed it her book of chronicles, seemed to be neither more nor less than the Salem Gazette for 1838. In the accuracy in which journal, the sagacious old year had so much confidence that she deemed it needless to record her history with her own pen. What have you been doing in the political way? asked the new year. Why, my course here in the United States, said the old year, though perhaps I ought to blush at my confession, my political course, I must acknowledge, has been rather vacillatory, sometimes inclining towards the Whigs, then causing the administration party to shout for triumph, 
and now again uplifting what seemed the almost prostrate banner of the opposition, so that historians will hardly know what to make of me in this respect. But the loco focos, oh, I do not like these party nicknames, interrupted her sister, who seemed remarkably touchy about some points. Perhaps we shall part in better humor if we avoid any political discussion. With all my heart, replied the old year, who had already been tormented half to death with squabbles of this kind, I care not if the, for the names Whig or Tory, with their interminable brawls about banks and the sub-treasury, abolition, taxes, the Florida War, and a million other topics, which you will learn soon enough for your own comfort. I care not, I say, if no whisper of these matters ever reaches my ears again. Yet I have occupied so large a share of my attention that I scarcely know what else I could tell you. There has indeed been a curious sort of war on the Canada border where blood has streamed in the names of liberty and patriotism, but it must remain for some future, perhaps far distant year, to tell whether those, whether or no those holy names have been rightfully invoked. Nothing so much depresses me in my view of mortal affairs as to see high energies wasted and human life and happiness thrown away for ends that appear oftentimes unwise and still oftener remain unaccomplished. But the wisest people and the best keep a steadfast faith in the progress of mankind is onward and upward, and the toil and anguish of the past serve to wear away the imperfections of the immortal pilgrim and will be felt no more when they have done their office. Perhaps, cried the hopeful new year, perhaps I shall see that happy day. I doubt whether it's to be so close at hand, answered the old year, gravely smiling. You will soon grow weary of looking for that blessed consummation and will turn for amusement, as has frequently been my own practice, to the affairs of some sober little city like this of Salem. Here we sit on the steps of the new city hall, which has been completed under my administration. And it would make you laugh to see how the game of politics, of which the capital of Washington is the great chessboard, is here played in miniature. Burning ambition finds its fuel here. Here patriotism speaks boldly in the people's behalf and virtuous economy demands retrenchment in the emoluments of, lamp, of the lamplighter. Here, the aldermen range their senatorial dignity around the mayor's, mayor's chair of state and the common council feel that they have liberty in charge. In short, human weakness and strength, passion and policy, man's tendencies, his aims and modes of pursuing them, his individual character and his character in the mass may be studied almost as well here as on the theater of nations. And with this great advantage that, be the lesson ever so disastrous, its Lilliputian scope still makes it the beholder smile. Have you done much for the development of the city? Asked the new year. Judging from what little I have seen, it appears to be ancient and time-worn. I have opened the railroad, said the elder year, and half a dozen times a day you will hear the bell, which once summoned the monks of a Spanish convert to their devotions, announcing the arrival or departure of the cars. Old Salem now wears a much livelier expression than when I felt first beheld her. Strangers rumble down from Boston by hundreds of a time. New faces throng in Essex Street. Railroad hacks and omnibuses rattle over the pavements. There is a perceptible increase of oyster shops and other embellishments for the accommodation of transitory denarial multitude. But a far more important change awaits this venerable town. An immense accumulation of musty prejudices will be carried off by the free circulation of society, a peculiarity of character of which the inhabitants themselves are hardly sensible, will be rubbed down and worn away by the attrition of a foreign substances. Much of the result will be good. Here will likewise be a few things not so good, whether for better or worse, there will be a probable diminution of the moral influence of wealth and the sway of an aristocratic class, which from an era far beyond my memory, has held firmer dominion here than in any other New England town. The old year, having talked nearly all of her little remaining breath, now closed her book of chronicles and was about to take her departure, but her sister detained her a while longer by inquiring the contents of the huge bandbox which she so painfully lugged along with her. <laughs> These are merely a few trifles, replied the old year, which I have picked up on my rambles, and I'm going to deposit in the receptacle of things past and forgotten. We sisterhood of years never carry anything really valuable out of the world with us. Here are the patterns of most of the fashions which I brought into vogue and which have already lived out their allotted term. You will supply their place with others equally ephemeral. 
Here, put into little china pots like rouge, is a considerable lot of beautiful women's bloom, which the disconsolate fair ones owe me a bitter grudge for stealing. I have likewise a quantity of men's dark hair, instead of which I have left gray locks, or none at all. The tears of widows and other afflicted mortals who have received comfort during the last 12 months are preserved in some dozens of essence bottles, well corked and sealed. I have several bundles of love letters, eloquently breathing an eternity of burning passion, which grew cold and perished almost before the ink was dry. Moreover, here is an assortment of many household broken promises and another broken ware, all very light and packed into a little space. The heaviest articles in my possession are large parcel of disappointed hopes, which a little while ago were buoyant enough to have inflated Mr. Laureate's balloon. I have a fine lot of hopes here in my basket remarked the new year. They are a sweet smelling flower, a species of rose. They'll soon lose their perfume, replied the somber old year. What else have you brought to ensure a welcome from the disconsented race of mortals? Why, to say the truth, a little or nothing else, said her sister with a smile, save a few annuals and almanacs and some New England's gifts for the children. But I hardly wish well to poor mortals and mean to do all I can for their improvement and happiness. It is a good resolution, rejoined the old year. And by the way, I have a plentiful assortment of good resolutions, which have now grown so stale and musty that I am ashamed to carry them any further. Only for fear that the city authorities would send Constable Mansfield with a warrant after me, I should toss them into the street at once. Many other matters go to make up the contents of my bandbox, but the whole lot would not fetch a single bid, even at an auction of worn out furniture. And as they're worth nothing either to you or anybody else, I need to trouble you no longer with no longer a catalog. And I must also pick up some worthless luggage on my travels, asked the new year. Most certainly. And well, if you have no heavier load to bear, replied the other. And now my dear sister, I must bid you farewell, earnestly advising and exhorting you to expect no gratitude nor goodwill from this peevish, unreasonable, inconsiderate, ill-intending and worse behaving world. However warmly its inhabitants may seem to welcome you, yet do what you may and lavish upon them what means of happiness you please, they will still be complaining, still craving what is not your power to give, still looking forward to some other year for the accomplishment of projects which ought never to have been formed and which if successful were only, will, would only provide new occasions of discontent. If these ridiculous people ever see anything tolerable in you, it will be after you are gone forever. But I, cried the fresh hearted New Year, I shall try to leave men wiser than I found them. I will offer them freely whatever good gifts providence permits me to distribute. And I will tell them to be thankful for what they have and humbly hopeful for more. And surely, if they are not absolute fools, they will condescend to be happy and will allow me to be a happy year, for my happiness must depend on them. Alas for you then, my poor sister, said the old year, sighing as she uplifted her burthen. We grandchildren of time are born to trouble. Happiness, they say, dwells in the mansions of eternity. But we can only lead mortals thither, step by step, with reluctant murmurings, and ourselves must perish on the threshold. But hark, my task is done. The clock on this tall steeple of Dr. Emerson's church struck 12. There was a response from Dr. Flint's on the opposite quarter of the city. And while the strokes were yet dropping in the air, the old year either flitted or faded away, and not the wisdom and might of angels, to say nothing of the remorseful yearnings of the millions who had used her ill, could have prevailed with that departed year to return one step. But she, in the company of time and all her kindred, must hereafter hold a reckoning with mankind. So it, like, so it be likewise with the maidenly new year, who, at the clocks, as the clock ceased to strike, arose from the steps of City Hall and set out rather timorously on her earthenly course. Happy New Year, cried a watchman, eyeing her figure very questionably, but without the least suspicion that he was addressing the New Year herself in person. Thank you kindly, said the New Year, and she gave the watchman one of those roses of hopes from her basket. May this flower keep a sweet smell long after I have bidden you goodbye. She then stepped on a more briskly pace through the silent streets and such as were awake at the moment, heard her footfall and said, the new year has come. 
Wherever there was a knot of midnight roisters, they quaffed her health. She sighed, however, to perceive that the air was tainted, as the atmosphere of this world must continually be, with the dying breaths of mortals who had lingered just long enough for her to bury them. But there were millions left alive to rejoice at her coming, and she, so she pursued her way with confidence, strewing emblematic flowers on the doorsteps of almost every dwelling, which some persons will gather up and wear in their bosoms, and other will tram others will trample underfoot. The carrier boy can only say further that this morning she filled the baskets with New Year's addresses, assuring him that the whole city and our new mayor and the aldermen and common council with his head would make general rush to secure copies. Kind patrons, will you not redeem the pledge of the new year? <laughs>